is not pretty for the Constitution. And in our democracy schools, which we teach across the country, where we train organizers and lawyers and all kinds of folks, we actually take a look at the Constitution and how it got to us. And it turns out, one of the things that we don't read about in history books necessarily is that prior to the Philadelphia Constitutional Convention, our very own George Washington, who was shooting lightning bolts from us from below a little earlier, uh, had a problem, which was he was a massive landowner, 63,000 acres of land, Trans Appalachia, he's one of the largest landowners in the United States. And to develop that land, he needed to put in canals. Well, George was no slouch. He went to the legislatures of Maryland and Virginia to try and negotiate a deal to start a corporation that would actually build the canals to develop his land. And in saying he wasn't a slouch, he didn't just go for a charter for the company, he also asked for a subsidy from Maryland and Virginia to help him build the canals to develop his land. Uh, he spent 10 years trying to get that charter. He eventually got it, but he was so pissed off at the legislatures that he came up with a plan and held a meeting at his, his place, the Mount Vernon Conference was what it became known as, to say we need a super entity that would actually override the states and localities on issues of commerce. And that turned into the Annapolis Convention, which was all focused on commerce, this, this centralized federal commerce power. And then that eventually was translated into the Virginia Plan, which eventually became the U.S. Constitution. And so a big part of the structure was all about how do we take commerce and clothe it with the highest protections possible under the constitutional system. And that has become not only how do we clothe commerce and property with those protections, but how do we clothe the people who own the property and who engage in the commerce with the highest protections. And that's why when Walmart comes in, they're building on 100, 200 years worth of law. What we see in the open is not as much as what's under the water. It's like the iceberg where you see 25% above and 75% you don't see it's underneath. We've accumulated law over the past 200 years. And the law has come out of the worst of the worst of this country's history, like Reconstruction, where we pulled the troops out of the South. Corporations now use those legal doctrines to control us in communities. And so the question is, how do we dig all that out? And how long is it going to take? Uh, because all of it has to be dug out because we have a 1790s plan of governance which is fairly archaic. It was written to guarantee that we could exploit the natural resources which were seemingly unlimited across the United States as quickly as possible. That's what the constitutional structure is about. And God damn it, they did a good job because we're still on the receiving end of it now and it's worked awfully well. But it's time to jettison that and it's time for a new constitutional framework. So what cultural shift do you see taking place in those communities? It's huge. Um, and it's huge because in some ways those communities are beginning to grapple with this concept that not all property is equal. That when they're on the receiving end of a Walmart coming in, that someone's big property coming in to swallow up their little P property. And that's something that we haven't seen before, I think. That, that division between the two, that, that kind of class warfare happening between uh, folks that are relatively privileged and other folks that are relatively super privileged. Uh, but I think that cut is starting to take place. And it's starting to take place because we're running out of resources. We're running out of, uh, at least in my opinion, running out of easy to obtain resources. And so the corporate boys are coming into places like Pittsburgh and proposing to drill for natural gas under cemeteries in the city of Pittsburgh, Catholic cemeteries. And so the, the body, when it dies, you know, it pulls oxygen out of every single place it can, even underneath the fingernails. And the corporate boys are starting, and have been for a little while, st doing that kind of work that's bringing communities that were previously privileged and safe from this kind of exploitation into a direct line of fire with corporations coming into their communities. And, you know, we talk a lot about corporations, you know, the, the C word. Uh, and, but it's not really about corporations, it's about a minority of people within the corporate form that have a super system of law that privileges them above community majorities. And so, I don't know about you, Derek, but back in kindergarten I learned that democracy was about something else other than that. It wasn't about minorities over majorities, it was actually the opposite way around. And what we have right now is a vested system where the interests are the other way around. And that's what people don't necessarily see, because we've been hammered in our heads ever since birth. The Founding Fathers were the best folks that ever trod the planet. Uh, that the constitutional system is the best system of law ever devised by man. Um, all these myths that have been circulating in us for so long. And the only folks we've seen that are able to come out of that myth 
building place and actually begin to engage in a real activism which is very confrontational and very controversial are the folks that have imminent harm happening to them. And the fact is more and more imminent harm is happening in places where it hasn't happened before and that's starting to radicalize populations uh, that we wouldn't have thought would become radicalized prior to this. And just as a final thought on that, the, our opponents helped us along uh, immensely. So in Pennsylvania, after we crossed 50 municipalities, so 50 municipalities passing these kinds of ordinances which uh, went beyond just stopping an imminent harm, but actually about deconstructing the system that enabled the corporation to do what it did in the first place, that the Pennsylvania legislature stepped in. And you know, some would say that when the Pennsylvania legislature steps in, they would step in on the side of the communities instead of the corporation. Some people might, might say that. Um, instead, the Pennsylvania legislature passed a law which now authorizes the attorney general of the state to sue the municipalities to overturn the laws that have been passed to keep the corporations out of those communities. So, whereas once you were facing off against a Monsanto rep who was coming into the community saying, Re repeal that ordinance or we're going to sue you, now the attorney general of the state comes into your community and says to you, if you don't repeal the ordinance that you've adopted to stop factory farms or whatever else from coming in, we're going to sue you, not as the corporation, but as the state, using your taxpayer monies to pay us when we pick up the phone and answer the call from the Monsanto folks, that we're going to come in and actually sue you in the name of the state, right? And so some people said to us, well, that's really bad for your program area. You know, it's really bad for your work. Now the state is shutting you down like that. To which we said, we think it's pretty fabulous. Because in the beginning, people think that it's about the corporation. And it doesn't do any good to tell them that there's a system behind it and it's actually enabling. But when the attorney general stands in your community building, your municipal building, and threatens your municipal officials and says, we're going to sue you in the name of the state, very quickly the problem statement transforms from being just about the corporation to being about this concept of the corporate state, that it's a system problem, not just a, an errant corporation problem or a corrupt corporation problem or a greed problem. It's actually a systems problem. And that framing is so important when people actually move to take a remedy or to create a remedy in response to that. A couple things. A couple things. One of them is that um, I read years and years ago that a former head of security during the South Africa apartheid regime, isn't that a nice word, security? <laughs> um, a former head of the state police uh, yeah. during, the, during the apartheid regime later said that the thing that they were most afraid of from the ANC was not its sabotage or even its violence, as it was the possibility that the ANC would convince the mass of people to not respect law and order as such. Absolutely. Um, because no security force in the world can stand up to a populace that recognizes that, that the security is in place because of guns. Yes. And that leads to the other thing, which is you know, I came to this realization pretty late, probably in my late 20s, early 30s, but it finally, I finally realized that laws aren't, like, aren't sacred, and that all they are is rules created by rich people to enforce what the rich people want. And that's a pretty, simple understanding, but it took me years to deconstruct all of my schooling that, and I'm not saying that there is, that there, that there's, that all laws are, shouldn't exist. I mean, I, I think it's great that, and this will get me kicked out of the anarchy club yet again, but I think it's great that laws against rape exist. Right. I think the existence of the Clean Water Act is a good thing. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah we could, we could have a serious discussion. Yes, about. absolutely. Um, but that doesn't alter the fact that, um, by and large, uh, laws are nothing more nor less than... Oh, it's like Eddie Izzard does this, this great thing about the conquest of India. Yes, I've um, seen that. Yeah. I love it. So yeah. have people seen that? Yeah. yeah. No. Well, okay, so the people haven't seen them do a really terrible Eddie Izzard impression. <laughs> but basically, um, they, 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 they came in and they... they, they said, this land is ours. And the people of India said, the British did, and the people of India said, you can't do that, we live here. And they said, well, 
but we have a flag. <laughs> and they said, well, what does that make? And so, well, um, these are the rules that we just made up. And that's basically how conquest works, and it's basically how, it's like the Attorney General's like, oh shit, we, how do we get Walmart into this community that doesn't want it? Well, pass a law, by gum. Absolutely. <laughs> which, is, which is why you'll never get elected president. <laughs> um, the British, when they went into India, um, created a culture of violence that also supported the need for those laws. So they created an environment that operated to support those laws back home. It's why English common law was used extensively to enable the violence to occur, which was extensive. I mean, the British, when they went into India, <laughs> cut the thumbs off of all the master weavers <coughs> in India to keep the uh, folks in India dependent upon English textiles. So they cut off the thumbs of all the master weavers. That's the kind of violence that went into colonialism. And it's that structure of law, that English structure of law, which became the U.S. Constitution, because our lawyers were were basted in English common law. They called it the best system of law ever devised on the planet. And so, which they would, which they would. All all the English, all the law books were English. Well, no, they, they yeah. would because it serves their purposes. Absolutely. I, I don't think the people of India or Africa or uh, North America would necessarily agree that it's the best system of law. Ever Absolutely, devised. I don't think they would either. Um, it's like when people come up to us now and they say, well, the regulatory system is broken. It's not protecting our health, safety, and welfare. And I say, well, maybe it's not broken, but it's working perfectly. Because its goal is not necessarily to protect health, safety, and welfare. It's for a different purpose. Um, but the law, I mean, I, I agree 100% that the law as traditionally as it's been used has been to shield, enable, um, uh, allow these things to take place. They're not called permits for nothing. That the, that the state agencies issue. They permit something to occur that would otherwise be illegal. Well, I have a great example of that. It's pretty trivial in some ways, but um, the, the, the frogs in the pond where I live are, are dying. And they're dying from something called saprolegnia. And so I was, and saprolegnia is a mold that uh, attacks weakened egg sacs. The egg sacs are weakened because of the uh, weakened ozone layer allows more UVB to come through. So if I bring the egg sacs into my house, I raise them. I do this every winter, starting about a month. I'll, I'll bring them in the house, I raise them up, and then I release them. And um, I was talking to somebody at US, US, or I'm sorry, at California Fish and Game about that, and just mentioning I was doing this, talk, asking for any help, you know, information. And they said cease and desist. Yes. Yeah. And this is the same organization that routinely gives permits to, to clear cutters, to Sierra Pacific, to cut all the land they want. And she was freaking out and saying, you cannot do this. I mean, you have to get a permit. I said, great, I'll get a permit. How do I do that? She said, I don't know. <laughs> we don't have ones for that. Let's yeah. have that one. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it was just crazy. But so, it's also, it, just to, to play on that, the craziness of it. I mean, when we did traditional environmental law, which was essentially appealing permits and moving through that process, is that we had at least several situations where we would catch somebody doing something they weren't supposed to be doing, didn't have a permit to do. And the state agency would actually retroactively permit the activity by fax sometimes. They'd write the permit and send it and it would come in by fax and they would actually retroactively permit the activity. And it's that kind of stuff that just says, what a load of shit, this whole... I mean, it's like built on nothing except I say so kind of thing. Before we get back to the official questions, there's actually another, since, since, uh... Is it Eddie Izzard related? No, it's not. <laughs> um, but I have a, I have a, uh, I have a legal remedy and a technological remedy that I've been trying to push for quite a while, and since you're an attorney, maybe we could actually have this discussion. Yeah, I think we covered this in our radio show we talked about. Yes, it, but yeah, it was, it was awesome. Um, so I have a legal and technological solution to basically all of our problems which is a very simple piece of technology called a, it's, it's a radio, radio controlled cigar cutter. Um, and basically the, the, the law, which I'm now, I want people to, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The law that I, I want to get passed <laughs> is that before anyone can put in a process for which they are permitted, um, like if somebody wants to put in an oil well in the Gulf of Mexico, um, they guarantee that it's not going to leak oil, then so you establish that all the people, all the males associated with the project have to have remote control cigar cutters put on their genitals. And if they're lying, or if the process doesn't work, I mean, if, they, if, if the oil well leaks, then... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I mean, with you. It would solve all the problems. Do you think, think we can get Pittsburgh to pass that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can patent it. <laughs>